Peter Bookvar joins us. He's the Bleakley Advisory Group's Chief Investment Officer and a CNBC contributor. Peter, great to have you with us. Um, was Powell's message, in your view, exactly what the market needed? Well, in a way, he didn't back off from his path of hiking rates uh, in light of Ukraine and Russia. Uh, he realizes the difficult situation he's in by having rates still at zero with the inflation we're having. And in fact, the Fed funds futures pretty much brought back the rate hike expectations that it lost over the past two days. So you're looking at like the December contract, it dropped about 40 basis points in yield, and today it bounced back about 30. So we're basically pricing in six again uh, based on Powell's comments, whereas of the past two days, it dropped uh, below that. Peter, when you look at the Fed right now, it, are they so far behind their winning as the, as the line goes? Do, are they so far behind the curve that they have to continue, or are they so far behind that they have to change their stance? And then the second part of that, is the 10-year showing me a recession? Well, to the first question, the two-year inflation break-even today closed at about 4.3 percent. So even if they raise six times this year, they take the Fed funds rates one and a half. At least right now, that is still well below where markets think inflation will be in the next two years. The inflation break-even the next five years is a 3.3 percent. So you want to talk about behind the curve. Well, you know, they're not even in the, state, in the same stadium or even in the same state at where they should be relative to inflation. Now, with respect to a recession, I, I think you talked earlier about what's been priced in. The bond market's priced in these, these rate hikes. What the stock market is not priced in, because we don't know yet, is what is the economic impact of these six hikes? What is going to be the market impact from not just ending QE, but shrinking the balance sheet at a more aggressive pace than they did last time. That's what's not priced in. We've had the multiple compression so far, but we haven't had a real change in earnings estimates, but I expect us to have it because there's no doubt that this will slow economic growth. Now, whether it leads us into recession, to your direct question, a lot of that will also depend on where the S&P 500 goes. Peter, it's Karen, thanks for being on. If you were to be named the chairman of the Fed, what would you be doing right now, given that you've been sounding the alarm for a long time on runaway inflation? Well, I would rather them get more aggressive on interest rate hikes early on to give them flexibility. So raise 50 and then maybe raise another 50, get us to 1%. Because then you can take a step back and you can wait, you can keep going. And, and give yourself some time and some, some communication. This every 25 basis point measured, measured pace doesn't really do the job because again, monetary policy directs the demand side of the economy. So Jay Powell can blame the supply side all he wants, but it's two-sided here. He needs to subdue the demand side, particularly in housing and autos. I mean, they have full pedal to the metal, encouraging everyone to go buy a house and go buy a car when there's not enough of them for sale. You should be Fed chair. I got you got my vote. Not that my vote counts, but one of the things people don't talk about, we try to mention it from time to time. Real wages in this country are the lowest it's been in, in forever. I think minus 3.1 percent, and companies have to pay more. Look what Target just said. That's been the final piece of this puzzle all along is wage inflation, and there's that's so far behind it's ridiculous as well. Well, one of the lessons that Volcker taught us is you need to have some short-term pain in order to get some short-term gain. And that means having to slow the demand side down in order to control inflation. Because you will not have a healthy economy or maximum employment unless you have stable prices. And the wage spiral situation that Guy you're sort of alluding to it, it is something that is an extraordinarily difficult situation. I mean, we are entering a stagflation environment. That's the reality, and that is a central bank's worst nightmare. So it's almost a pick your poison situation for Jay Powell, and obviously uh, no easy way out, because how do you subdue consumer price inflation without too much damaging asset price inflation and slowing growth to an extent where it, it would be damaging on that end also? Peter, always good to see you. Thank you. Peter Bookvar, Bleakley Advisory okay. Group. Tim, Peter used the S word. Do you agree? Is that on the horizon, stagflation? 
I, for a minute there, I was going to choose a different <laughs> Me one. Me too. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, look, I, I, I agree with the sentiment. I agree with the forces at work here. They are stagflationary. Are we getting to, you know, full stagflation? Well, look, growth is slowing and inflation moves higher. I, I'm not one of these people that thinks it gets a lot better in the second half of the year. I actually think it could get a little bit worse. Everything we're talking about with, with inflation here uh, built into the services economy is something that has a lag effect, if anything. I think companies who have pricing power have started to pass along, but a lot of them have no choice. We haven't really seen much yet. So um, I also think that, that uh, in terms of the consumption dynamics here of full employment, uh, this is what Guy and, and Peter are both saying. I, I think you erode buying power for even that lower middle class who suddenly are getting 20 bucks an hour uh, as, they, as they should. Um, but I think this is a dynamic where um, some of the trades that, that are working, uh, I, look, I, I think there's structural reasons why commodities are moving higher. It's not just uh, s supply disruption from the world's fourth largest aggregate commodity exporter in Ukraine and, and denying Russian product from the market because we're, we're blocking them out of it. it. It's because most of these resource companies haven't reinvested in their businesses in years. We're talking about miners that, that, that obviously grew too fast, that ran their businesses into the ground, that had balance sheet issues. Um, and, and I think, you know, fortunately, through those crises that were five years ago um, learned to run their companies better, but they didn't reinvest in capacity. I think copper, uh, you know, supply demand dynamics are probably the most, um, you know, in, in conflict. In other words, I think we actually have, even without supply disruption, I think you've got an imbalance in the copper market. I think we, we see a lot of what's going on in, in, in you know, wheat and commodities prices. I think those could actually be worked off faster. Um, but I think there's no question that the oil and energy companies uh, are not just a trade here. They're better run companies that are giving money back to investors. They all talk about moving a greater portion of free cash flow or, or EBITDA in, in terms of their uh, either dividend payout ratios or overall how they're going to approach their balance sheet. They're not reinvesting in CapEx here. That's great for investors. There's more to this trade.